when I talk about the these are really business history talks. They're the history of the industry, which really means the history of people. Um, but they are not. For example, and tonight, as I went through the whole computer history thing, there are a million different paths I could have taken. So this is not a history of uh, the cultural impact of the computer, which is enormous. I mean, uh, you can't help but touch on it a little bit, but you could give, I could give a whole other talk for hours and hours about how it's impacted our lives and, and all the, the social commentators, people like Marshall McLuhan and stuff, a guy named Ted Nelson wrote a lot of stuff on computer lib back in the 70s. So there's a whole tradition there of the way it interacts with our lives. And it's also not a history of science and technology and engineering, because I could stand up here, well, I, I probably wouldn't be the right person to give that talk with all the great engineering and computer science talent we have on this campus. But uh, you know, you could give a whole history of the microprocessor and how it all works and everything. Again, can't help but touch on that, but this is really about the enterprises and the people that built them. And um, I'm going to run through a bunch of images here and talk about them. And it should take an hour about, and, and then um, have time for discussion, question, answer, whatever works for you. So that's my little introduction. And uh, mankind has been, and womankind, have been trying to calculate, add things up uh, forever, you know, and all different types of systems. The abacus was the main system for a long time, and it's still not impossible to find it being used in places in um, uh, China and around the world. And, you know, people were very fast on it, but people have been uh, trying to add and subtract all along. And, and one of the things that struck me as I went through this, because one of my observations as a computer user is that when I started being interested in computers myself, I always believe in trying to link history to your own life, because it makes it more colorful and memorable. Um, and I got my first computer uh, soon after the first PCs came out. And I've watched them move from basically being office machines, being typewriters and adding machines to being, oh, media machines, you know, ma making movies and doing sound and uh, ma creating music and all that stuff. And I was thinking, well, so it's really a big shift because they used to be just about m office work and now they aren't. Well, in a lot of ways that's true, but in some other ways, if you really think about it, all they've ever been are adding machines because multiplying is just a form of adding, right? And, and subtraction is just negative adding, <laughs> and then division even is a kind of an extended form of subtraction. Because I started studying the old calculators and how they worked and everything, and you realize it's all about digits. And it's not so much the computer learned how to deal with music and movies and everything, it's that we learn how to convert movies and music to numbers, you know, because it's all binary, you know, it's all ones and zeros, it's all electricity either on or off. So that really, still today, all they are is adding machines. They're just faster, cheaper, better, more accurate. One of the early people, 17th century French guy, uh, a philosopher too, Pascal, his dad was a tax collector. And he said, wow, we ought to have a better way of you know, adding. And he invented this machine, which you take a little stylus, you put it in the circles, and you turn those things, and the gears all hit each other, and the total is shown in the little holes up above. So this is uh, whatever, over 300 years old. And, and that, um, certainly up until the 50s or 60s, you could still buy. I just got this one off of, uh, eBay. This is an adometer. It's supposed to come with a stylus. The person that sold it to me on eBay didn't tell me it was missing the stylus. So here we have a screwdriver. But you basically turn the little circles to whatever number, and, and it shows you, and you, if you want, afterwards you can come up and take a look at it. <laughs> but they made it, and then you clear it out like that, and it starts over to zero. And by turning them backwards, you can subtract. So it was a very advanced thing. But the thing is, these were still being sold up into the 50s and 60s, and they were direct descendant from Pascal's invention. There have been lots of people do lots of experimental things with all these, um, trying to come up with better ways to calculate key guy, Charles Babbage, around 1800, a little after that, British guy, obsessed with what he called first a difference engine. And um, it was this giant machine with all these gears that would add stuff up. And you'd punch in the number somehow and turn all these gears. And he spent a big chunk of his life trying to make that thing work. And he got subsidies from the British government. Um, he actually, uh, uh, he never wrote up the full description of the thing and how it worked. But a young woman named Ada, 
She was Lord Byron, the poet's daughter. He had a lot of children. He wasn't married very often, and so she, she didn't have his last name, I don't think. But um, Ada was a, a young math wizard and science wizard, and she, she was much younger than Charles Babbage, but she wrote it all up in a book. And so still, the best book that describes Babbage's work was by Ada. And later, if you are a programmer, you know there was a software language called Ada. And that was named after her. But anyway, and people are still fascinated with Babbage's work. He actually, towards the end, he kept getting money from the British government because what they were trying to do was calculate tide tables. Uh, you know, the tides come in and go out, and you have to have different numbers every year for every point on Earth, right? And you had to run all these calculations. And it was trying to do that faster and better because they were inaccurate. They would have rooms full of people writing them up and then have two people do the same calculation to check each other, but even so. And so it was really the, go uh, go the government who made those tide tables. Uh, and later on, we get into World War II and stuff, the government wanted um, ballistics tables. If you're firing a gun at the other guys in World War I, World War II, whatever, they always had a new gun, right, a howitzer or whatever, big artillery. Well, to know where, how high to angle it and where to shoot, you had to know the wind, you had to put in the uh, weight of the uh, projectile, you had to know what type of gun, how big the gun. So they made these massive tables, big fat books that went with every gun. They couldn't calculate them fast enough. So in many cases, it's, military, it's government and military uses that really press the need for better calculation. Now later on in the 20th century, partially funded by IBM, I believe, some museum guys in Britain got, built some of Babbage's machines. Because some of his later machines, his first one was called the Difference Engine, later the Analytical Engine, well, they were never built. They were just in his dreams. But, you know, the guy spent his whole life trying to figure out how to do this. So there's this long track record of that. Another little historical tidbit that needs to come in here was at some point, I need to do a little more research on this, a jacquard, which is a, a fellow that invented a loom to sew all these intricate patterns in textiles, he created a punch card system, and that ran through a system, and somehow it read those cards, and that's what told it what to weave and all that. And th so that really predates the computer, and that concept of those cards plays a critical role in the evolution of the computer. As time's going on, we get to the 1880s. This is the Central Telegraph Office in London. Thousands of messages an hour coming from all over England. They're all sorted out and sent on to the next people. You know, it's, it's a, like a hub, like Federal Express today or something. And so these offices were getting bigger and bigger, and they couldn't keep up with all the calculations, things they needed. This was a pneumatic tube system there in the Central Telegraph Office, the CTO in London. And, and pneumatic tubes, if you are old enough, you may remember retail stores, big department stores. You go in, you pay for something, they would send the cash in a little tube thing, you go to the somewhere in the back room, they'd make your change and send it back to you. And those are still in use at branch drive-up banks all over the world, actually still made by the same company, a company called La the Lamson Company. It's a main maker of pneumatic tubes. Uh, I don't know if you see that very well, but that's out of Scientific American. But it's all just, uh, they're just amazed at the Central Telegraph Office in England and everything that's going on. <laughs> Throughout all this, much of the computer industry evolved out of the office machine industry because that's what computers initially were. And um, there were several key makers. Royal was the first one to make really good portable um, typewriters. And if you study the history of the typewriters, just an amazing history. At first, the keyboards, there was one set of keys for capital letters and one for small letters. And then oh, somebody had a breakthrough and figure out how to make that carriage. If you've ever typed on a real typewriter, the whole thing moves. And so the little keys strike differently, but that's a working, those, they, there are a lot of typewriters still out there. Um, and uh, this is from Remington. They had all different types and experimented with them. Uh, Remington became a major maker of typewriters. Uh, L.C. Smith was another maker, Underwood. Uh, another thing um, that's a little off in the angle, here's a real one. This is a comptometer made by the Felton Tarrant Company in Chicago. This one's probably made in the 20s. And you could type in your numbers as you added them up. All in there, it would ding when you knew you were typing. And then you type in the next number, and it would just keep adding them in the little holes down here. And when you clear it back to zero, it's like that. And this, you can check it out afterwards, it's really heavy. They made a ton of these guys. And so people were adding, they were typing, 
I love that name, comptometer. And one of the things, too, that you see is in the office equipment industry, when these guys came out with these new machines, nobody knew how to use them. So the typewriter companies, the adding machine companies, would run big schools and big training centers. And you see that throughout the history of all this technology is a big share of the effort goes into servicing the equipment, repairing it, teaching people how to use it. And so this is a comptometer school. And, and while I'm touching on this, I didn't find a, an ideal photo for this uh, concept, but if you had walked up to somebody in, certainly in the 1930s, but I think maybe even in the 40s, and said, oh, come in this room, I got a bunch of computers in here. Close your eyes, so, you know, imagine, why do you think, have they then opened the door in the 30s and said, oh, look at all the computers, what, what would have been in that room? What would have been in that room would have been a whole bunch of people, primarily women, as a computer was a person who did the calculations. A computer was not a machine. And the word was in common use. And so this same picture of comptometer school here, that's probably what a computer room would look like. And that was a common use, uh, that was what the word meant. If you walked up and said, oh, I want to be a computer. Oh, well, go to school and learn how to be a computer. Um, Underwood, another company, later sold out to the Italians, Olivetti. Now here you can see they're getting more complex. They're doing invoices and things, and they got numbers and, and words together. A company that was a key player in all this was the Burroughs Company. Actually, William S. Burroughs, the crazy, the beat writer. He was from the same family. They're originally from St. Louis. They moved to Detroit. Uh, they were famous for their accounting machines and most of the banks in the country. They were one of the biggest suppliers of equipment for banks. Um, but they became a, we'll see their name again. Uh, uh, interesting company, and there you can see a real complex typing device of some sort. Uh, here's a Burroughs adding machine to compete with a comptometer. Uh, later on, uh, this would have been uh, 40s and 50s, but I grew up with one of these. My dad had one of these, but Victor was one of the biggest makers of adding machines. They were another Chicago company. Later merged with Comptometer to form Victor Comptometer, one of the great corporate names in American history. Huh? Uh, and, and one of the things I wondered is, why do they always have all these instead of a 10 key? Because the, the same company at the same time made a 10 key one. Well, the thing is, it was so much slower with a 10 key because you had to type zeros, you know? If you type the number 10,000, uh, that's uh, well, five things you've got to hit. You type the number 10,000 on this. Well, they made wider ones too. This one, so $10,000, you hit one button, you hit the one. And people, the people that were trained that went through those schools, they could hit, you know, six, seven buttons at once, right? Bam, 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 bam. So these people were really fast, and these machines were made for speed. Okay, now we come to a key figure in the modern, well, I call it modern. My sense of time is a little different from a lot of people's. Um, Herman Hollerith. Herman Hollerith, a smart guy, uh, upstate New York, uh, ends up going to work for the census. The Census Bureau is handling more data than anybody on Earth, right? They're up, the U.S. Census, by... Um, 1880, 1890's got 40 million people. And it's got to tabulate male and female and where they live and their age and whatever. You know, data, the government wants data. They're also beginning to tabulate industrial information, information about businesses and everything. Um, and he works there and he's a tinker and he says, well, we gotta have a, a better way of doing this because everything's by hand, right? And yeah, they're using adding machines or whatever, but um, and so, and, and it was actually a Dr. Billings, who later helped create the New York Public Library, who was a senior guy there. He compiled all the medical data, because people were also interested in what diseases, where do they move to, what causes them, how fast they spread, all that mortality information, what do people die from. Anyway, Dr. Billings said, well, you know, you ought to make a machine to do all these basic add additions and everything. And that set Hollerith to thinking. And actually, Billings also said, I think maybe a punch card thing would work. Now, Hollerth went off and tried some other things. He wasn't convinced of that, including punch tape, where you take a long tape and you punch stuff in it. If you were in computers in the 60s and 70s, you will remember punch tape machines. Well, eventually he realized, well, punch cards really do the trick. And so this was an early Hollerith punch tape, punch card machine. And so you would use this machine to punch holes in it, and there'd be a hole for male, a hole for female, a hole for a person that was 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, a hole for Indiana, a hole for Illinois, whatever, you know? It was all marked on the card. Take that data, and you drop it into a machine, and, and it would run through it, and what it was, so it's a punch card full of a lot of holes. Here, I'll pass around some punch cards. These are 
keep these if you want. These are late stage 80 column IBM cards. Uh, you got enough punch cards, huh? <laughs> punch cards for the world. Computer lib now. Uh, anyhow, so the thing is, uh, the punch card had holes in it, and <laughs> uh, these don't. These are fresh, fresh off of eBay. Um, they uh, had holes in it where the data was, and they'd set that on a little plate, rubber plate, and uh, little pins would drop down on top of it, one for every possible place there was a hole. It's like 80 columns by 10 rows. And later figuring out how to make it 13 rows. But anyway, and, and, and if there was a hole there, the pin would drop through it, and it would drop into a little cup of mercury and make an electrical contact and say, oh, we got one here, you know? And one of these little dials, because there was a dial for every hole, one of these little dials would click ahead one. It was like one for hundreds and one for ones. So, the, you know, dial, like minute and second hand on a clock or whatever. So they turned at different rates. And then when you got done, you did a stop card, a whole card with no holes in it. Okay, everybody stop. And then you'd write down all the numbers off these things, clear the whole system, start over. And if you needed to rewire it for a different thing, like, oh, on these new cards, the males are over here and the females are over here or whatever, well, then you had to go in the back and unsolder it and resolder it and all that. But still, it was a huge breakthrough. And in fact, Holler had tried. He would punch these cards originally with a conductor's punch from a railroad, which is part of what, where he got his idea, too. He'd seen that being used on the railroads. Um, it, he almost paralyzed his hand one day, seeing how many he could do. So this system, uh, a person could do 500 cards a day and not get tired. So, and here's, you know, Scientific American again. Thank God for them. And they're, you know, cranking away in the Census Bureau, making a big difference with these systems. And there's a lady, you know, tabulating stuff. And they're called tabulating machines. And there you see, punching away. They started out with circular holes. They later went to rectangular holes. They worked better with the electrical brushes or what they later went to. Okay, so don't forget, Herman Hollerith, because we're going to pick up on his story again in a few minutes. Uh, another key guy in this whole story is a guy named John H. Patterson, one of the greatest business people in American history, one of the least known, uh, kind of unsung. He would have been very famous in the 1920s, um, kind of at the end of his era, but um, he made cash registers. He had a company called the National Cash Register Company in Dayton, Ohio. Huge facility, thousands and thousands of workers. He dominated the world cash register business, not just the United States, but all over the world. And that's another thing, is these companies really starting, from what I can tell primarily with Singer, the big sewing machine company, which was an older company, they were the first one to make machines in quantities, and they had to be repaired, and had to be watched over, and serviced, and sales agencies all over the world. And needless to say, the sewing machine had a dramatic impact on the world, and the labor productivity of the universe, or whatever, I mean, you know, it was a big deal. Well, cash registers, you know, your money's getting stolen, you don't know how much money you should have at the end of the day, you can't keep track of everything. So it's really, in many ways, kind of a security device. But he's cranking cash registers. He's a very aggressive competitor. Um, and and uh, uh, there's different stories about how he would go in and um, try to uh, go in not saying it was National Cash Register. One of those people wouldn't say, oh, here, look at this, you know, Jones Cash Register. And they'd show it to the store and it would break in the middle, you know, because he had rigged it to break. And it say, oh, oh, these are no good, I'm sorry, and whatever. And then National came around. It, it was a different era. We're talking 1890, 19-teens. Anyway, uh, he was, um, uh, but the stuff that he did, here's his schoolhouse. He had a movie theater every day for his employees. I think it was called, what was it called, welfare work or whatever. There was a term, though, for paternalism, for being good to your employees, you know. Uh, he ran parks for them to go relax. He had vacation systems. He had educational systems. Um, uh, many, many of the things that came up in late 20th century and 21st century business came from John H. Patterson. His greatest thing was he was one of the greatest salespeople in history. He really, not just the kind of edgy things I mentioned, but he really knew how to sell stuff and he knew how to motivate salespeople. And his top salespeople got awards. They had big conventions where they all sang and everything. Here's the NCR song where they're singing about what a great man Mr. Patterson is and what a great company we work for and we're all NCR men and everything. And um, so, uh, and, and a lot of things came out of NCR. Um, companies still exist today. 
A man named Charles Kettering was their main uh, scientific guy, and he used to have to crank cash registers. He figured out how to make a little electric motor that turned the cash register, and later, later when the auto industry needed an electric starter instead of cranking the autos, which was very dangerous. People even died from that, you know. Um, he, uh, Kettering was a guy that created the electric starter for the car, and uh, he went on to become the chief scientific person at General Motors. And uh, best data I can find, he held more patents than any person in U.S. history after Thomas Edison. But he came out of NCR. He was one of Patterson's boys. And he was a friend of this guy. This guy, well, he's a great story. He grew up upstate New York. So much of this came out of upstate New York. He, um, Oh, he was out selling pianos, sewing machines. Uh, he has a horse and carriage, and you know, he'd go door to door and say, oh, I want to sell you a piano, and he'd, he'd have them on the back of the wagon and everything. And one day, he, he has a big sale, and so like most of the other salesmen, he pulls into the local bar, and he celebrates, and he gets too drunk, and the bar closes up. He comes out of the, the bar, and his wagon has been stolen, and his samples, right, and everything. He gets fired for it, has to pay the company for all the stuff he lost. He's like... Um, uh, can't, has trouble finding another job because of words out of the guy's a drunk and didn't take care of the company belongings. Anyhow, so he later runs a company you're familiar with, and they never had alcohol in that company, you know, ever, you know. Uh, he, 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 I guess you'd say he learned his lessons, but in any case, he was a pretty, um, had his own beliefs. But he was, he ended up being a salesman for NCR, working his way through, took over the Rochester office, took it from a money losing office to a money maker, uh, attracted Mr. Patterson's attention, worked his way up to become the chief salesman for NCR, for Patterson. And there he learned such ideas as company songs, cheerleading, how to really take care of your customer, because they were very sales and service oriented. But he also, because he'd worked with Kettering, he understood the importance of science and technology. And um, so, and, and at the, in his NCR career, we come up to 1910, 1915, somewhere in there, federal government investigates them because they have like a monopoly. I mean, they have a huge market share. And they say, and you've been doing these dirty tricks and everything. And they end up indicting whatever, 15 or 20 of the NCR executives, but both Patterson, the CEO, and Watson, the sales manager, get jail terms, okay? Well, about the same, but, they, but they're appealing, so nobody's going to jail yet. About the same time, um, Patterson asked for his resignation, not over the legal stuff. They were in that boat together. Uh, they, um, but most of what you read indicates that Anytime somebody got too powerful in Patterson's organization, it made him nervous and he got rid of it, you know. You'll see that. That's not an unknown pattern in major businesses. But in any case, uh, that's the general word of what happened to Tom Watson uh, Sr. And uh, so he's looking for work. A group of guys, including a guy named George Fairchild, had put together a new company, a, a trust, a kind of... Uh, conglomerate wouldn't be quite the right word, a group of office machine companies in like 1910, 1911. And they saw Watson looking for work, said, would you like to come to work for us? And they actually made him general manager, not president, said he couldn't be president until he cleared his name in the legal problem. And within a year, uh, the case was dismissed. Nobody went to jail. Actually, one of the reasons that Patterson didn't go to jail is Dayton had a huge flood, and he personally saved the city, whatever, you know, provided all the food, came up with all the money, and so it's like, well, we can't really send this old boy to jail, you know. Um, but, but Watson didn't go to jail, either, so his name was cleared, but, and, and Fairchild was the president of this company. Watson was the general manager. What it was was it was a merger of three companies. It was a merger of the tabulating company, which was Hollerith's company, okay, the punch card Empire, the computing scale company, which made things like this, a scale, you put it in a computing scale because it actually had prices. You've seen the ones that have all the prices down there, so you could just look up and see how much stuff sold for. And the International Time Recording Company, which was a company of George Fairchild, who was an entrepreneur in upstate New York that he was an investor in. So they merged these three companies and formed uh, the Computing Tabulating Recording Company in 1911 with that wonderful logo. Okay, they brought in uh, Watson Sr. as general manager within, in, uh, he came in in 1914, so in 1915 he became president 
And nine years later, he renamed the company International Business Machines. That was actually the name they had picked for their Canadian subsidiary. But they'd run with it for a few years and really liked it so well, and it had such a nice ring to it, they changed the whole company name to it in 1924. So um, uh, Patterson took over in 19, uh, I'm sorry, Watson took over in 1914. Uh, there's the, I still think that's a cool logo. Um, uh, hey, punch cards, man, and they were making, one of the things, too, that Hollerith had done, and I haven't yet found out why, but Hollerith never sold his machines, his punch card machines. He always leased them. You paid $1,000 per year per machine. Even the census did that. They would get like 40 machines and everything. So it took more capital to finance it, and Hollerith was always broke. He was barred from his relatives, and then they all cut him off, and then he never talked to him again, and he was a classic entrepreneur. Uh, and, and he had sold out to these other guys, 1911. <laughs> uh, but um, the thing is, um, uh, they later found out the square worked better. But they made a lot of their money selling the cards. They sold them a dollar a thousand. And they were talking about they created, they invented their own machine that could make, um, what was it, uh, 16,000 of them a minute. Yeah, yeah, because the average worker in the factory made $16 a week. And so in one minute, it made as much, or no, it, was, it, was, uh, six, it took 16 minutes to make 16,000, so 1,000. Anyway, thing is, in, in 16 minutes, it made as much money for the company as the, they paid the wor workers for a week. Uh, but, um, and so they made a lot, but the thing is, is by having leasing rather than selling, while it took more capital, they had a much steadier flow of income. And you'll hear the term recurring revenue, you know, income streams. A lot more businesses, they talk about that subscription model, the company Hoover's uses that. So they were an early user of it. And then Watson Sr. ran it <laughs> until he was a real old man. The idea of the word think, which became a big deal with IBM, he took that from Patterson. The idea of having sales conferences and sales incentives and songs. and I mean, it was just all right out of Patterson's book. Um, but he did an amazing job. And under him, he basically ran it until the early 50s. You can see the sales, 4 million, 11, 19, 145, 70. The number of employees from 1,300 to 50,000. So, and, and that's really mainly on the punch cards. And that and other office equipment. It's sad. One of the other key companies in all this, I mentioned Remington typewriters, which were actually the old Remington gun company, you know. They had gotten into typewriters. They lost control of it, but it ended up merging with a company by the name of Rand. Rand was a fascinating company. They made card filing systems for big companies. Actually, if you work at the University of Texas and you go get a key to your office, go into the key building, it's like a whole building over here, you know, there's a big bank back there that says Cardex on it. I think it's K-A-R-D-E-X. Well, that was what James Rand created. James Rand Sr. created one company. James Rand Jr. left his father, created another company. And then late in life, in the old man's life, they got back together and merged them. But they were the dominant company, and they wanted to build a bigger um, office equipment um, major powerhouse by lots of different categories. And actually, by the 1910 census, IBM had lost its domination of the punch card business. There were patents. They had patents, and they began to expire. And there was a competitor at IBM called Powers, and the Remington Rand people bought that. So Remington Rand was in typewriters. They were in adding machines. They were in all this stuff, and they were really kind of the guy to beat. And, and, and by... Well, certainly by the 30s and 40s, it was run by Rand the son, Jim Rand Jr. Couldn't even find a picture of him on the internet. I mean, this guy is so forgotten, and there is no history book written of this company. Even though it still exists, its, it's descendant is a company called Unisys. But we'll come back to that. So, but it's an important company in this whole story, even though I could find very little to show you about it at that stage. So we stop here in 1928. So Watson's been running IBM for 14 years. Rand, as clearly the son, has been running his. And here we got Remington Rand, almost $60 million in sales of office machines. National cash registers at $49 million, huge market share with retailers. Retailers and banks have lots of data to deal with. They have always been at the leading edge, along with the government and the weather forecasters and the Department of Defense. Anyhow, so NCR had the retail stores, boroughs had the banks, essentially. NCR also got into the banking business in a big way. So those were the giants. IBM was here, much smaller, and an Underwood, you know, another little office machine maker. And there were others below this. But what's interesting here is they were, IBM, uh, Burroughs, and Underwood were incredibly profitable, if you measure it profit as a percent of sales. 
And uh, in IBM's case, part of that was selling cards, punch cards, because they had to be, you couldn't buy them from somebody else because they had to be precise to work in those machines, you know. The hole's in exactly the right place and uh, the whole thing, all the system works. It's interesting, Remington ran, I'm not sure why, they were not as profitable. I clicked forward 11 years in the Depression. By 1932, Remington Rand sales dropped in like half. The Depression hit, they collapsed. IBM's never collapsed because they were a subscription deal, right? They were paying an X dollar a year rental. So unless you return the machine and said, I don't want them anymore, your revenue, the revenue of the IBM company stayed the same. So here we see IBM, you can see the only guys making decent profit after 10 years, you know, eight, nine years of the Great Depression. Sales, they were still behind Remington Rand, but they caught up right behind them. And then here, if you look at the profit as a percent of sales, they're in a class by themselves. And in my future numbers, I'll show you tonight about IBM. I don't include all the profit data. The company was just a money machine, an absolute money machine throughout its glory days. Um, 1948, which we're getting closer to the real computer era, here is how they stacked up in sales. So we make it through World War II. And, and all these people had different things going on with the Defense Department and all that. But they come out and they kind of land on their feet in post-war America. NCR is number one. IBM is up to number two. Remington Rand is right in the pack with them. But Burroughs is still an important company. Underwood, Smith with their typewriters. Monroe and Marchant were calculator makers. They had come along after the comptometer people and gotten bigger with new making these machines that calculate. And so that's a Monroe calculator. It's a manual one. You cranked it, but you can see all the parts that turned and everything. And then this is a later one that's a electromechanical, still not electronic, you know. It's, it's like, a, uh, you know, I talk about the airline industry, the great propeller planes, the Lockheed Constellation, the late 50s. They were the most powerful uh, propeller airliners ever built. And then right then, jets came along and, oh, we don't need them anymore. So kind of they reached their greatest, most powerful form. And if you're an airline buff like I am, their most beautiful form right before the end. So likewise, the railroad industry, one I'd like to give a talk on sometime that I really love. They're the giant steam engines. The last ones they made were the most powerful, most amazing, right before they retired them all and went with diesels. Well, likewise, calculating equipment really reached its glory days right before the onset of electronics. And, and these guys, and that's a uh, Marchant made on the West Coast. They later merged Smith Corona typewriter guys with Marchant, created a company called SCM. Um, and in my favorite, Frieden, also on the West Coast, uh, they were the first one that could do square roots. And I, th I don't know, probably took four or five minutes for it to do a square root, right? Because that sucker's just, and so I really want one of these really badly. You know, these, these are cheap and easy to find. These less so. And so there have been twice since I started working on this lecture, I was on eBay, and, I, and they'd have a Frieden for sale, and I'd say, oh, oh. Uh, they'd say, it works. i say, well, can you test it for me? You know? Or they'd say, I don't know how to work it. So I, I, uh, you know, uh, I, th I think it works fine. It looks fine. So I'd say, OK, press in two numbers there, which is a multiplying keyboard, and press in three here, and then hit this guy, uh, whatever, this guy, multiply, and see what happens. <laughs> and, and I just learned that from finding you know, user's manuals online, because they're all, like everything else on Earth, there are collectors all over the world. Mainly a guy in New Zealand and a guy in like Idaho helped me on this one. Anyway, so I told him, hit that, and one poor lady emails me back and says, oh, it started smoking. I don't think it's supposed to do that, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, hey, yeah, well, I don't think you're going to get your $300 for that one. And then another one was the same kind of thing. It made weird grinding sounds. So I have yet to get my uh, Frieden or Monroe or Marchant. Uh, calculator. If anybody knows if there any one sits, uh, let me know. Because uh, I just want to hear the sound they make. They've got to be amazing, you know. Well, it's, and the inside is just, I think it's 9,000 parts or something, one of those. So that's what we were up to before the coming of computer. And this guy, man, when I was a kid, those were still in wide use. You know, every engineer, slide rules. The kind of change in technology has been a little rough on the slide rule companies, but okay. <laughs> There are many, many books written in history of the computer, a lot of them about the science of the computer. Uh, there are a lot of books just on how it evolved in and around World War II. 
And there was a guy named John von Neumann at um, University of Pennsylvania, Moore School of Engineering. There were a bunch of key people in uh, England. There were people that broke the Nazi codes, the code-breaking machines uh, in England. There's book after book after book. I'm just going to pick on these two from all that uh, literature because it was. It was World War II that, man, these ballistic charts and stuff, they really had to crank and move. And these two guys at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, computer science kind of guys, I don't know if they called it that then, uh, Presper Eckert and John Motchley, they began to make big, cool machines. And there were others, too. There was a guy named Howard Aiken at Harvard. Uh, there were others, but these were the guys. Well, a lot of the other professors said, oh, I just want to be scientific and make it for science and everything. These guys saw that, well, maybe it could be a business machine. And they, even if it was just for science, they would like to sell them. They'd like to start a company and you know, increase their family's um, well-being, you know, maybe get rich. So they got together, formed the Eckert Motchley Computer Company, the MCC. There were a lot of other people around. And they first did, well, one called the EDVAC. And all these computers at this stage were now were in 1944, 45, 47, 48, um, one of a kind. They didn't build two of any of these. And, and I just here, I kind of hit a gold mine of good pictures to show you what some of these guys were like because um, they were enormous. You walked into them. These are all the circuits because they're using uh, tubes. If you're old enough, you remember that used to be a thing called a TV repairman. You come out to your house and you try all those things, right? Or the tube testing center down at the corner drugstore. Well, these guys had thousands and thousands of tubes because that's what preceded the transistor, which in turn preceded the integrated circuit and all the things we know today. These things are giant. And you know, wiring them together. In many cases, to reprogram them, you'd have to go rewire the whole thing for another case. Next thing they did was called the ENIAC. OK, ENIAC had 19,000 tubes. And I didn't check their numbers, but the, uh, one of the books I've used for this talk, um, uh, it said that the average tube lasted 3,000 hours, which if you figure it out, means a tube would give out every 10 minutes when you got 19,000 of them. And so that's why computer time was really precious, because you'd want to run a, a formula. And they, these things were not calculating very fast, you know. And, and, and you'd have like eight to 10 minutes before a tube would go out. And you'd have to shut it down, find the tube, start it back up again. Um, whole rooms. And an enormous amount of heat. I was trying to look it up before I came here today. I, I can't find how much heat they threw off. But it's just enormous. You could hold, heat whole cities, you know, because it's all these tubes, thousands of them. And the Eckert and Motchley, they were working like upstairs above a factory building in Philadelphia or whatever and just sweating their brains out, you know. Um, and, and here we are working away. Actually, that might be them. Yeah. And they got the point. Jim Rand wants to build his office machine empire. He already has one. So he's number one in the industry, or you know, right up at the top. And he buys them out. And, and it becomes part of Remington Rand. And it's real interesting because by 1954, they had, whatever, five times as many computers installed as any other company on Earth. Now they had like 10 installed or whatever. But you know, thing is, they were the guy. And, um, and he brought in heavyweight people because he wanted to impress the world, impress Washington, still a big customer for computers. And so Douglas MacArthur came back from the war. He was, I think, named vice chairman, something like that. Leslie Groves was put in charge of a lot of this. Leslie Groves was the general who was in charge of the Manhattan Project that gave us the atom bomb, one of the most amazing business managers in, in the history of the United States, if you study the life of Leslie Groves. So old Jim Rand was bringing in talent. He lost the battle, lost the battle for leadership. The best I can tell, since there's no really good history written of Remington Rand, is he was just too fragmented. He was trying to run a typewriter business and everything else and didn't have the focus. Um, and the other thing, too, is a lot of these computer companies, the people who made the decisions or drove the decisions were the technologists. They loved, we want a faster CPO, CPU or whatever, bigger CPU, more power. Well, the company that won didn't, didn't think that way. The company that won was basically a sales and service company called IBM. In any case, what Remington, when he bought out Eckert and Motchley, what they came out with was the Univac. And that was the one that had sold 10 and was the, was the computer. And, and you're going to go back to that era, books called like The Giant Brains, about all these amazing machines that were going to change the world. And, and again, we're still in a stage 
where <laughs> isn't that cool, man? I, I wish they'd put a control panel on my laptop like that. Would that be? <laughs> be sitting in an airport, people would notice you. Uh, <laughs> they, um, you know, just and 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 the graceful design, you know, or early 50s, leftover from Streamline Art Deco. You know, go inside, rewire them. That'd create a few jobs, huh? Oh, this is a great thing. This is a mercury delay line. They had they had to figure out how to store data, right? You know, the answer you want to hold it and use it in another calculation. Or later they decide you might even want to store programs. That was a different idea. Originally you program just by moving wires and stuff like that, throwing switches. So they how do we hold data? You know, delay the electronics working or the electricity working. And so this is using mercury, and I forget, I was gonna look it up. It it holds either like one digit or ten digits, and it weighs 40 pounds or whatever, right? You know, and um, there's a big one in a museum somewhere, and and you know this um, bought this at the University Computer Store yesterday, uh, 16 gigabytes, so whatever that is, 16 trillion or whatever times as much space, 39 dollars. And actually, I was thinking about it. And I said, well, did, 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 did I get a super cool deal because I'm university staff? And, and I looked on Amazon, it's four dollars cheaper on Amazon, you know. So that's the real price on those silly things. It's amazing. Uh, we come a long way from these old boys. Um, you know, look at that man, Univac. And they were the name. You'd ask the average person, oh, who makes the big company? Oh, it's Univac. That, in fact, they would call it, it's a Univac. And it came from Remington Rand. So the game was theirs to lose, man. They were running these ads, you know, just all these great pictures. Um, Oh, they got the census contract, you know. <coughs> they were head of IBM, uh, standing in the thing. And um, so here is uh, some of their ads. Oh, tapes, mag tapes. Okay, 1952 presidential election. All the pollsters had said it would be neck and neck between the Republican Dwight Eisenhower and the Democrat Adlai Stevenson. It's going to be a horse race. It's going to be a close one. Well. Make news, you know, Univac, old man Rand was still pretty savvy. Let's, let's provide him a Univac and we'll do like exit polls or ask people and we'll add it up and we'll have the computer make a projection. Walter Cronkite, I think it was the first presidential election he covered. You know, there's a new exhibit over here at the LBJ uh, Center um, about Cronkite. I haven't been over to see it yet, but I, have, I hope it touches on this. Anyhow, yeah, CBS to use electronic robot to forecast election results, <laughs> you know? And, and so the thing is, they ran that machine, and it came out, and it said Eisenhower's going to have a landslide. He's going to just roll over I, uh, Stevenson. And the CBS executive said, oh, come on. Hey, we know that's not true. You know, that's wrong. We, we've read the newspaper polls. And, you know, we'll look like idiots. It's a silly computer. Nobody knows if they really work. And um, so CBS came on the air and said, oh, you know, the early results from our computer says it's going to be a squeaker. You know? Well, uh, the computer got it right within, uh, I think, three or four electoral votes. Eisenhower blew away Stevenson. And, and later that evening, something wouldn't happen to corporate America today, maybe, uh, uh, CBS came clean and said, well, we lied to you. <laughs> the computer was right all along. And anyway, um, but uh, I don't know if those recordings, it'd be great to see Cronkite talking about all that. Later on, really, uh, it was like 1955 or 6, wasn't much later, a company called Sperry, gyroscopes, you know, defense contractor, big company. They were actually bigger than Remington Rand by then, but those two merged and became a company called Sperry Rand. But their Univac division remained in the computer business, and it, it has evolved to what we call Unisys today. Uh, still, 1956, you've already got the Univac, this stuff's beginning to happen. It's still relatively small potatoes within the office equipment industry. Punch cards and cash registers. I'm not sure why they grouped them this way, this government data. 187 million. Typewriters, 183. Accounting and bookkeeping machines, 116. Electronic computing, 94 million. Adding machines, 60. Calculators, 56 million. And, uh, you know, it's pretty big numbers when you adjust for inflation back to 56. But even so, it was, it was you know, half the size of the typewriter business. Okay. Old man Watson gets old. He has a son who's a playboy and ne'er do well, useless, hopeless. Uh, you know, I don't know. No matter what you read, you know, rich kid. Because uh, uh, old man, he was one of the highest paid executives in America. He took care of himself. He took better care of his stockholders, and he took good care of his employees too. I mean, it, it really was an amazing company. It's glory days. So the kid takes over, uh, 54, give or take, and you know, 
It doesn't look good, right? <laughs> well, kid did okay, you know. Thomas Watson Jr., uh, I did here every five years. 570 million, billion six, three billion two, seven billion two. He retired in 1970, I believe. Took it from 50,000 to 258,000 employees. Um, and I just threw it in for extra. He had long retired, but they reached their peak employment in 1985 with 405,000 workers around the world. And the sales were 50 billion. But really, most of the growth, certainly in the employment, was in this stage. And, and both father and son, because it was the father who was making big strides working with the military and willing to risk, because these guys took big risks. They would try whole new systems and have whole groups of people go off and work on stuff when they didn't know if it would ever pay off. And that was something that was true of the father and the son. Uh, you know, the IBM, the big blue, or itty bitty machine company, whatever you want to call it, that we all, uh, certainly I grew up with. Don't forget, they were a leader in electric typewriters. They came into that business. I don't think they were even in the manual typewriters, but they became, uh, if you're old enough, you remember this electric with a little ball that spun. Um, but they were cranking Endicott, New York, making computers. Their first big one was called the 1401. There's its control panel. And, and they just blew away Univac and the other guys. And, and it really was. They were great. They didn't always have the best technology, but they were amazing salespeople. And they believed in service. If it didn't work, man, they were there. They fixed it right away. Um, they were just smart business people. And this is still a 1401, I believe. Yep, there she is. Oh, yeah, see? Powerful. 16K CPU, which they were obviously very proud of. Um, this, actually, the card punch, which uh, that's another thing you see throughout it is does your new equipment, is it compatible with your old stuff or not? Will your new software work, you know, will the old software work on the new computer or not? And all through this, you see these companies battling those kind of issues. And one of the things is they still use the 80-column card. And actually, I think they may have sold even more of these card punches than they sold 14-1 computers, because you could use them with the old system. They're just cranking them out. Endicott, New York, their big plant. Big, beautiful system. Oh, actually, also, I was reading their printers was a huge breakthrough. When they started making, if you remember, those high-speed big printers just blow that stuff through there, uh, they, that was a big IBM breakthrough. So they, were, they weren't just focused on the CPU, on the heart of the thing. A lot of their competitors were. They said, we've got to have better printers. We've got to have better card punches, whatever, you know, uh, peripherals, we would call them today. And that was. They sold a ton of those printers. And I imagine they sold the, machine, the parts to them. Um, Junior, he's older now, big gamble, late 50s, early 60s. Do they completely have a whole new computer system or just incrementally improve upon what they're doing in the past, what they've been doing in the past? But they said, well, you know, we'll get taken over, passed up sooner or later if we just do little stuff. And we know there's these problems with the old stuff, and we really need a complete system. And so he, in 1964, introduced, there he is on Time Magazine, uh, I'll just skip ahead here the picture. Introduced the IBM 370, 1964. I will get my numbers in. So even before that, uh, here, I ought to touch on this. Even before that, here's how badly he was demolishing the competition. So just from the 1401 and the other stuff, a billion two, and then Sperry Rand, who created the business in many ways, 145 million. I think AT&T was just making systems mainly for their own use in the telephone companies. 97 million. Of course, Bell Labs, an amazing place, gave us a lot of technology. Controlled data, that was a guy that came from one of these other companies and made bigger machines, a guy named Norris. Uh, Philco, the old Philadelphia battery company, later became part of Ford. They were a tube maker and everything. They are really an electronics company. Burroughs is still in there. GE and RCA, two big electrical and electronic companies decided to get in. Uh, NCR and Honeywell are in there. So it's office machine companies and electronics companies. Basically, electronics companies, because there were smaller ones like Raytheon and stuff, the electronics companies all bombed out. None of them succeeded in the business. And the office machine companies, over time, what they call it, they call it um, IBM and the Seven Dwarfs. The ones in red are the Seven Dwarfs, right? And because Velco got out pretty early, and AT&T was not really a head-to-head -head competitor at this stage of the game. It was IBM and these Seven Dwarfs, you know, and they just, all, uh, combined, they don't total nearly what IBM was doing. Never, so from a position of strength, from a position of owning the industry, he spends, oh, Watson Jr. spends millions and millions of dollars developing the IBM 370. Incredible amounts of money for the time, and a complete new, from scratch, integrated system. 
And that came out in 1964, and that gave IBM industry dominance for the next 20 years. Basically that, because they later came up with another, a future idea, and they were going to do the same thing again, and they never pulled it off. It was too complex. They kept trying. So they never really did that again to this degree. And the other thing, too, I got to mention, both NCR and IBM had a department they called the Future Demands Department. So again, this was a case of Watson Sr. taking a page out of John Patterson's book at NCR. I thought it was really interesting because I used to work in a strategic planning department for a big company and you got all these futurist departments and all this looking forward. This company was one of the most forward looking companies on earth and it wasn't a strategic planning department. Maybe they had that too. But the big thing was the future demands department. And even its name says what it was about. It was trying to anticipate what are our customers going to ask us for in five years? What are customers going to ask us for in 10 years? So it, had no, it didn't have anything to do with mergers. It didn't have anything to do with uh, what we would traditionally call strategic planning or, or only modestly overlap. Uh, you know, um, it wasn't really technology based. It wasn't, oh, what are we going to invent next? Because IBM invented plenty. If you look at how many patents that company turned out, amazing. No, it was about what are our customers going to need next? And that was a Patterson idea, and in his glory days, that was an idea that I think served IBM very well. Anyway, the 370 took over. There's your control panel. And, and the other thing, too, uh, just a side thing, one of the things I see in all the talks I've given is the importance of design, of things looking good, you know? And IBM was one of the greatest companies in that regard. They hired some of the top designers in the world. That was Watson Jr., maybe, although I think even Watson Sr. had, had made him look pretty cool in the 30s. But the, their whole design ethic and the whole buildings and this type style and all that, to have that integrated for a big company like that, they were one of the first ones. Something Steve Jobs maybe learned something from. Oh, I have one of these at home. I was going to bring it in. I forgot, although it weighs like 6,000 tons. Uh, it's, it's, you know, and it was like 25 platters, 24 inches across. And I forget, I think it's either one megabyte or five megabytes, you know. So, okay, after all that, after 20 years of System 3, 7, uh, uh, 3, 360 and 370. They, they, they did two in a row, but they were not a, a totally radical redo. General, uh, IBM is still just you know, roasting everybody else. And in fact, even by 83, you can see the Japanese are in there, a uh, couple of places. Sperry Rand's at the bottom, but the, part of that, they accounted for things a little differently. It actually should rank a little higher than that. Um, but in any case, IBM owned the business. In that context, and, and uh, we go back to World War II and after World War II, go back to the 50s, uh, the Soviets had put up into space Sputnik. Uh, it was pretty clear, oh man, those suckers can fly over the North Pole and drop bombs on us. We better do something about that. So they'd begun, there was a project called Project Whirlwind. There's a whole lot, like saying you read book after book, af uh, book after all this, about all this stuff. And so for the first time, they had to have computers talk to each other when they set up a defense system radar across the northern, you know, NORAD and all that. And they also, for the first time, had to be real time. Everything before had been batch processing. You write a program, you have a bunch of data, you put it in there, come back the next day or the next year or whatever, and the answer pops out. The idea you would need an answer right away, or you'd need to get an answer to somebody in another city right away, or the computers talk to each other. And that was a different trip. And the military had, and with this whirlwind thing and everything working on it, one of the guys working on that was this guy, Ken Olson. I guess it tells everything about him right there. Thing is, he came out in uh, 1957, started a company called Digital Equipment Company. And so here, this is like the radar screen, and you begin, you know, uh, real-time data, you know, actually in front of you. Instead of cards going in the machine and cards coming back out and big printouts coming out, it began to shape that, and he created, he ended up a, a computer called the PDP-8. And this is what was called a mini computer. And this was a huge deal when I was younger. Uh, I guess it still exists, but all the terminologies cha change. But he really created the first mini computer and rose to a really powerful position within the computer industry. And, and I was on Wall Street in the early 70s. This was one of the best stocks you could buy. It was an amazing company. And many of the computer science students all over the world learned on PDP-8s because they were cheaper. They were like, whatever, they were 50 or 100 grand when the other machines were a million or two million. And so it was a big deal to come up with this mini computer. And they were smaller. They didn't require their own dedicated room anymore. Guys that got in that bandwagon, these two dudes, Bill Hewlett and David Packard. Okay, here they are. They're younger. Started in this garage, working away on that table. 
became a big maker of laboratory equipment, oscilloscopes and all that essentially. Well, when they really got into computers is when they hopped onto the bandwagon of the mini computer uh, because it was smaller and it was more like a kind of product they could sell. They didn't have that huge big machine that IBM did to call on and sell you multi-million dollar machines. And this is the HP 3000. And the company I built, Bookstop, later on in our evolution, not at the very beginning, we, we were blessed to have uh, HP 3000 system. Uh, but they, they were really fine machines. And so the mini computer business uh, grew up in the 70s and everything. By the 80s, here we got Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, 2.7 billion. IBM got into it a little late, but man, they rose. And by the late 80s, they were number one. Burroughs was in it. A company called Wang Laboratories. They made desktop calculators, high-end ones, and they also made among the first word processing machines, dedicated word processing machines. They made nice little minis. Um, Hewlett Packard got into it. Data General, another company that focused on mini computers, was a really nice little company. There was a whole book written about them, I think, The Soul of a New Machine, classic book about computers, right? Uh, Prime and Tandem, two of the smaller ones. And there's still business leaders here around Austin that came out of uh, some of those Prime and Tandem companies and stuff. Uh, and just so I touch on it, uh, yet another category was supercomputers. Giant machines, I made very few of them. They were hand wired by a guy named Seymour Cray who came out of control data and then started his own company called uh, Cray Research. This is one of their machines to deal with all the heat they threw off because even though they were using, you know, integrated circuits, they still threw off a lot of heat. Because these are the kind of things you use to forecast the weather and do giant processing tasks that IBM couldn't handle. It would be very difficult. So there was that supercomputer field. Here's what changed everything. Transistor came out of Bell Labs, Texas Instruments. A lot of books on that, the whole history. First use the average American saw was a transistor radio. Good old Regency here. Available in all these nice colors. And that's the guts. And you know, it's funny. You look inside a computer today. It doesn't look that much different. It's a bunch of wires and a bunch of metal things. And they all talk to each other. Um, OK, remember. Tom Watson Sr., George Fairchild, upstate New York, they put together CTR. George Watson, uh, I'm sorry, George Fairchild had a son, Sherman Fairchild, who, uh, who uh, it's pretty clear he was a playboy and not always real serious, but apparently had a pretty good mind. He invented this really cool aerial camera that was used uh, uh, by the military and everybody. And he created a company called Fairchild Camera Company. Some of the guys who'd helped invent, we moved from the tube to the transistor to microelectronics. Some of the guys who helped invent that worked for a guy named Shockley. He was a brilliant scientist. He was an impossible guy to work for. They wanted out of there. They ended up going to work for a company funded by Sherman Fairchild. He was rich. He still was among the biggest stockholders of IBM from stock he'd inherited from his father. Okay? And, and, uh, and they created a company called Fairchild Semiconductor. And if you study the semiconductor industry, the microprocessor industry, almost all the people who built that industry were people that used to work for Fairchild Semiconductor. I got a check. I don't even know if it's still around anymore. In any case, out of all that, three of the guys who came out of that were these three guys, Andy Grove, Robert Noyce, and um, Moore, Gordon, right? Gordon Moore. OK, they founded a company called Intel. And they, uh, it's floating around Austin somewhere. I couldn't find it in time. There's a one page. They wrote a one page business plan and raised their initial capital. Started a company called Intel. Okay, they're, and they're making little chips, right? Little, because now you're, instead of transistors, it's getting tinier and tinier and faster and faster and figuring out ways to get that heat out of there and everything. And a Japanese calculator company called Busicom, or you said Buzzicom, I don't know. Anyway, they came to them and said, we want you to put the whole brain of the calculator on one chip whole chip that does everything. And that was what gave us the microprocessor. Those, the calculator business in the early 70s, there was a company called Bomar, Texas Instruments was in there. There was a huge price drop. There was a big price war because the electronics came down in price. And this company went bankrupt. So they actually never used the chip, which was called the 4004. That evolved into, this is an Intel CPU microprocessor, the 8008 which later evolved to the Intel 8080. So these were the very first where the whole computer, the whole brain thing, still needed peripherals, printers, input devices, whatever. And there were other companies in it. Motorola with its 68,000 series, sold a lot of those. And a lot of these early microprocessors went into cars. What I see the other day, a BMW has 350 microprocessors in it, something like that. Cars were much bigger users of these than computers were in the very early stages. And actually, I was reading, I think it was General Motors that first used it for the trip computer. 
because they wanted to use it in a non-critical part of the car and find out if it really worked. They didn't want to use it for the brakes or the engine or something that mattered. And so those trip computers told you how many miles per gallon you average and everything. That was among the first uses. Uh, this was a company called MOS, and they were big makers. Uh, the Apple computer, the PET computers, I'm pretty sure they were all 6502s. It was later bought by a company called PET so they could control their own supply. And also, okay, so these chips, they've been coming along out of the electronics industry. The story I just told with Intel, this guy, Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico, he made telemetry systems oh, for model, model airplanes, model rockets. And he said, oh, you know, maybe I could make a little computer, like sell it to consumers. And in January 1975, cover of Popular Electronics Magazine, world's first mini, they called it a mini computer. The term PC and the term microcomputer did not yet exist in our language, in usage. Mini computer kit to rival commercial models. And it was called the Altair 8800. And that was Ed Roberts' company. And that's what Bill Gates saw. That's what all these guys saw. They saw that magazine. They, they, they got it quickly. That's what started everything. This might be a little later model. And the way you programmed it is you threw all those switches. So OK, I want to do this. You throw all the switches. And the way you knew what the answer was is the lights came on. There was no printout. There was no computer screen. There was no nothing. But, and so it was totally a hobbyist market. And that's one thing you see, especially as you come into the PC era, is these guys like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, none of them were pursuing money. They were all pursuing these crazy hobbies they had. And, and uh, some of them had better business sense than others. Uh, another company came along right after that, a company called MSI 8080. That was actually run by a businessman, Bill, I think you say Millard, M-I-L-L-A-R-D. And he created a company called Computerland, which was the first retail chain of stores selling computers. But he also had this manufacturing company. And they actually, I think, passed up the Altair real quickly because he was much more into, oh, let's make them in quantity. And, and so, uh, yeah, this is his company, MSI. So he got a whole 10 megabyte system. And see, now we got a keyboard and we got a screen. He understood that because he was a businessman, this guy Millard. And it's only 6,000 bucks, you know? And oh yeah, that's the other thing. The other guys won. The power kept going out. It, power supply didn't work. And so actually it was his power supply that was one of the biggest selling points that people loved about these MSI machines. Okay, these two dudes. Um, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak. Uh, they had met each other there in Silicon Valley. He's from adopted blue collar family. They're both college dropouts or going in and going out. He's kind of a hippie guy, goes off to India, wants to learn about the Beatles, and hangs out in India for months. He's more the nerd, the computer designer. First thing they made were called blue boxes. These two guys got together, and a blue box was a gadget that made sounds like a pay telephone, and you take it up to a pay phone, hold it up to the receiver, and hit the right button so you can make free phone calls anywhere in the world. So it's basically illegal, immoral, illegitimate, and everything else you want to throw at it. Anyhow, and they, they had a good time. They sold a bunch of those. And they saw this thing hit with this, oh, PCs. And, and they, they were definitely nerds. But he was, everything I've read about him, he was, you pick the word, arrogant or self-confident from like when he was 13 or 14, you know. And he was kind of a bundle to handle. And they didn't stay together, you know. I don't even know if they talk anymore. This guy went off and took his millions and started making rock concerts and stuff. Uh, teaches, actually, last I checked, he teaches elementary school because he loves doing it. Anyway, the Waz and Jobs, that's their first product. That's the first Apple. Here's the ad for it. So it's a board, right? You've got to put everything else together yourself. And Byte into an Apple because, you know, Byte is the unit of the computer logic. Byte Magazine was a magazine. Byte Shop was one of the early retail chains. And then... It was, it was Jobs. Jobs was the one who said, oh, this can be a business. This can be fun. Whereas Waz just wanted to make more cool computers. And he was the one that came up with the Apple II. And here we see, and, and actually the article I was reading said when they ran this ad, here it's supposed to be dad doing the family accounts. So there was no software available for the Apple II that did accounting. There was no software for the Apple II that did any of this. There was no recipe software. None of the stuff they said, oh, you can do it with an Apple. Yeah, it was, you know. But, but he did. Jobs understood keyboard and screen. And she obviously is delighted. They have, there's, there's one. Uh, another chip, very important chip, Zilog Z80, actually financed by Exxon. Um, and that chip was used by Radio Shack 
which really launched into this business in a big way because they had thousands of stores all over America. And the Radio Shack management didn't believe it, but one of their buyers, a guy named French, up in Fort Worth said, oh, we ought to do it, we ought to do it. And they finally said, okay. And they thought they would sell, how oh, is it, 3,000 a year. They sold 10,000 the first month. And I, I haven't pinned it down for sure, but it looks to me like they were by far and away the biggest seller of PCs in America for maybe a year or so. They were, appear to be much bigger than Apple. All this is taking place 1976-77. That first one, that ad on the magazine cover, that story, that was January 75. These guys are all, I think this one hit maybe in the fall of 77. The Apple may have hit as early as 76. But they were cranking these. But you can see, you know, it's the first complete low-cost microcomputer. Now it started at like $699. Because I, I bought one and I bought, did the bookstop business plan on one of these puppies. And every time a storm would come up, you'd lose all your data because the magnet, the cassette tape would blow up. And, you know, and you had to use your own TV later. they. You could buy extra and buy that unit. Otherwise, you use your own TV. Um, it was a wonder. It was a wonder. I think it was a 4K memory. And then the, another 1000 bucks if you went to 8K. Whatever. And, here, and, then, and then later came up with floppy disks. And, uh, and then bigger boxes, more integrated. This one's still with the cassette. Here you can see the whole rig advertising. That's a German ad, 889 Deutsche Mark. And then here, old, old uh, Asimov advertising. You want to, now, you know, he was an interesting guy because he was a science fiction writer who was afraid to fly. As far as I know, he always took the train. Um, but he did ads for Radio Shack. Good for him. Um, Radio Shack, retail lecture sometime. Radio Shack, one of the most amazing U.S. companies. Another key player, a company called Commodore, had a product called the Pet. Yeah, earlier I said Moss sold out to Pet. They didn't. They sold out to Commodore, which made the Pet. This was a big seller. Later, Commodore 64 is like a $200 computer. They're really crashing through the price point because now you're beginning to get some aggressive entrepreneurs in there who were really business people said, man, we can drop the price and crank them out. We can do what Henry Ford did. And I have one of those in the closet too somewhere. Um, yeah, it's a good little machine, much more advanced in certain regards. Atari, Nolan Bushnell, the game company, who Steve Jobs had worked for, had helped make games for, and well, he got $7,000 for inventing a game, but he had Wozniak really invent it, and he gave him 300. Maybe that's why they didn't really get along all those years. Um, uh, but anyway, Atari got into it. I have one of those in the closet, too. That's a, a, um, a membrane uh, keyboard. So it's just a little cheap plastic thing. You know, I was like, well, how long is this going to last? Well, you put it in the closet before it died, so who knows how long it lasts. They later came up with these fancy ones with real keyboards. Uh, again, some sense of the price. This is buying an external hard drive so you can keep data, more data than you can ever imagine in your life. 10 megabytes, $5,350, right? Yeah, they're dropping in price. Always happens in electronics. 10 megabytes is down to only $34.95. Because you could, well, if we're talking late 70s, I bought my first car, brand new Pontiac, and my dad still was pissed off at me because I spent seven grand on it. So half the price of a car, a good car too, Bonneville. Um, I had to throw it in. That's, I wrote the original inventory control system for Bookstop because the software didn't exist to do it, and I did it on one of these. There were lots of smaller computer makers all over California, North Star, Horizon, Chromemco, and everybody, oh, these are going to be giants someday. And this was one of them. They made some of the best equipment. And, um, and it actually, it did a great job, ran around the clock. And, very early stage, but this was all the same era. Um, well, well, they didn't have a software, and the breakthrough software was VisiCalc. It was the first spreadsheets, a couple of like Harvard guys, and they came out with this thing, and it was for all of them. I got it for the Radio Shack, the TRS-80 from Radio Shack, but it helped make Apple. Uh, they say as many, I don't know, a quarter, a third of all the apples sold were sold because I wanted this application because it was so powerful. In my own application, this was before I started Bookstop while I was still working for a big retailer in St. Louis, is I took the time it took to do what they call a dilution analysis without getting into all that. Uh, I took that down from it took a day to it took 20 minutes. And it was all because of VisiCalc running on a Radio Shack computer. Um, which, uh, which I had to convince a Radio Shack manager to loan to us because the May Company head of data processing said, never will a product show up in our building that doesn't say IBM on it. I mean, there was no way they would buy anything but IBM. So I had to like kind of smuggle it in and do the job faster. Anyway, and that was what the screen looked like. I still think it's one of the most revolutionary things of the 20th century. I mean, it really was. The, the impact it's had, the power, and it's such a simple idea. I've tried to trace back where the idea came from because I didn't realize it. 
Apparently there were some that were available on mainframes, mainly on GE mainframes. But to have it real time, recalculate automatically and all that, amazing. There were other applications. The next thing was word processing. And the big one there was called WordStar. Because VisiCalc owned the market. WordStar owned the market. And DBase2 owned the database market. And that's the software I used to write the inventory control program for Bookstop. It, was, it owned the market. And those people made a fortune and they burned it all up. In fact, part of the fortune went to create the company, um, the mall, Sky Mall, the catalogs in the back of the airplane pockets. They, the, one of those guys backed it. Anyhow, and I can't leave out games. And as far as I can tell, if I got the picture right off the internet, this was an early screen from one of Richard Garriott's early games. You know, Richard Garriott is one of Austin's great entrepreneurs. Um, the guy went into space a year or two ago, and he uh, built a game company. It's why there is a big game industry here in Austin. And he sold it to Electronic Arts, but he still creates these massive multiplier, multiplayer games. But he was there at the very beginning. He was a very, very cool guy, really wonderful person. And this was early, early one of the games. These two dudes, um, got a couple pictures of them. Paul Allen, Bill Gates, buddies uh, from Seattle, but they'd moved around. Gates went to Harvard. His dad, he wanted him to become a lawyer. He dropped out of that. Allen actually did graduate from college, one of the very few. And all oh, of this, here they are, you know. You don't think some of those guys were hippies, huh? Um, yeah, Paul Allen and Bill Gates, you know, Allen later got cancer and kind of dropped out of things, and, and, but still is one of the richest people in the world. Um, and what they made is uh, software. And this was, I have one of these in the closet too somewhere. This was one of their very early products. It was a spreadsheet. It was not successful. Um, VisiCal won that battle. But, uh, and, and, and in that case, they were both nerds. They both loved to program and everything. But uh, Gates clearly had a business orientation. And even at either 13 or 14, he had started a company called Trafo Data, which was gathering traffic data somehow. And, reselling it. But they would, Gates would sneak out of his house to go in the middle of the night over to the University of Washington Computer Center and program all night. And his parents wouldn't know and then sneak back in before they got up in the morning and all that. So they, they were the real thing, you know. No question about it. This guy is an interesting guy. Uh, I don't hear much about him. His name's Don Estridge. He's working at IBM and he says, we ought to go into this business. These guys are all making these little computers. We're the computer guy. And everybody said, oh, well, they're really I bring it here? Uh, I thought I had an article with me. Maybe it's still in the car. Um, it's a, an article from the mid-60s in the computer magazine saying, oh, is there any future for these little standalone computers and everything? So everybody doubted it. It could never take on what a big computer does. It isn't serious computers. It's only for hobbyists because businesses weren't yet buying them. You know, Radio Shack and Apple were trying to convince businesses to buy them, but what not happen? Estridge worked at IBM, convinced them to go into it, and to go into the whole hog and create the IBM PC to make it an open platform. Anybody can write software for it. Um, no, it was a revolutionary thing. They had dabbled. This was, a, I think they called it the 5100. This was a desktop computer, but it was real expensive. And some of the other guys had dabbled too, but they cost a fortune. But he came out with a mass-produced cheap IBM PC, and that changed everything. And he went to get an operating system for it, because they had an operating system. Went to a guy who probably made the best operating system, a guy named Gary Kildall out in California, had a program called CPM, Control Program for Microcomputers or Microprocessors. Kildall wouldn't deal with IBM or whatever, was too busy to see him. Or, there's a lot of different stories. He later lived in Austin. He died a few years ago. You can find a lot written about him. He's considered the guy who let it get away. Because then IBM said, well, who else do we go to? And they went out to this kid. Bill Gates and Paul and this other kid, Paul Allen, and they said, yeah, we'll make an operating system for you. And they didn't have one written, but they had friends who did. They bought it from, the IBM said, okay, we'll do it. Uh, they went and they got something like $20 a copy for every IBM PC that was sold, which gave them this huge cash flow that allowed them to go off and start doing other stuff and go deeper into software. But, I mean, there's no question that Gates is a brilliant business, had a great business sense from a very early stage. And so this is what came with your IBM PC, and there's your Microsoft stuff. Now, I got it, like I say, when I talk about all this history, it helps me remember it if I can make it vivid in my own, uh, you know, related to my own life. So uh, August 1985, Bookstop had started in Austin, expanded to San Antonio, and then Houston. We finally built up the courage to go to Dallas, where the best 
probably the best bookstore in the United States was, an independent store called Taylor's. And the fellow who had built Bookstop with me, my uh, partner, uh, he had come from Taylor's, so we knew all about how fierce they were. And so we didn't go there right away. So they, it was a big deal. And we opened, we'd opened uh, two, st two stores on the same day in Houston, went to Dallas, we opened three stores on the same day. Big deal, because I remember that morning, August of 85, uh, there because all the advertising, TV, everything, so oh, they're all open this morning. And, you know, 7 a.m., I get a call from our woman who was a VP in charge of building stores, said, hey, the, the Plano um, Fire Department won't let us open. <laughs> you know, oh, great, you know, because it just screws up everything. Well, she got it open, we got it open, and, and, uh, and it was just hot. It was one, like even a record day for Dallas. And I remember real vividly, and my, uh, my parent, and I remember, of course, the grand opening, three big stores, very, very successful grand opening. And my parents were in town, as they often were for our grand openings, and to take a break after going to the stores over and over and over and again, driving all over Dallas, over and over and over again in that heat, took a break, and we went to Valley View Mall, big mall on the north side of Dallas. I actually used to kind of work there. I lived on their parking lot. I worked for a department store, had a store there. And, um, and I'm in that mall with my parents, and we're walking through this big mall, which is still there in North Dallas, and, and on the TV is news, and it's a giant Delta airliner had just crashed at DFW Airport. I don't know how many of you remember that, but it was August of 85. It's one of the worst plane wrecks in American history. It was a, turned out to be a microburst, a thunderstorm thing, and pulled that. And Don Estridge was on that plane. And, and he was the driver behind the IBM PC. And, and there were huge lawsuits afterwards where his family was suing the airline and everything because they were saying, oh, look, you're only giving us what he was going to keep making next year. But he, he had like gotten four promotions in three days or whatever at IBM, and he was going to make a lot more. So it was, uh, but it also, who knows what effect it had on the uh, IBM PC and its evolution. Um, so I, I just remember that day. And, uh, well, you know, you're walking in a mall, and oh my gosh, a plane wreck, where's that? Oh, it's four miles from here. You know, made for a somber evening. Um, okay. In all that, nevertheless, Estridge and, and all other people involved, obviously, and, and Austin played a key role in all that. There, by 83, eight years after that first magazine story ran, they're up to two billion six. Apple, a billion. Commodore, the pet, and the Commodore 64 and all that, 900 million. Radio Shack still in there. Hewlett Packard and Sperry ran, but I gotta believe that at that point, what they were doing was probably just selling microcomputers to their corporate customers. I don't think they were out selling to the consumer at that point. I don't think Sperry Rand ever sold to the consumer. And there were other people, you know, there were, and here in Austin, a town called CompuAd, Texas Instruments got in it for a while. Um, uh, three years later, it's the earliest data I can find, here was the software business. The venture capitalists wouldn't back Microsoft. It was growing too slow. They backed Lotus. It was the biggest. Computer Associates was an older company that sold software for big mainframes, and they had moved, begun to move into this group into, uh, for smaller computers, although this is software for both big and little machines. A company called Novell, Oracle, which has survived, only 55 million, about the same size as WordPerfect back then, which was a guy who'd come up after WordStar, chased him. Borland later did Quattro Pro and all that, and then kind of faded, still exists. Uh, Adobe was only doing 16 million. So, you know, that's how much it's changed in uh, 24 years, the software business. The IBM PC, because it had an open system, it allowed for clones to occur. Couldn't do it with an Apple. Well, people tried, it never quite worked. You could do it with a PC. And this guy went to the University of Texas, Michael Dell, dropped out. The rest is history. It's an old press picture of him on the production line. And I think. And I can't tell for sure, but if I, my Google images worked right, this is a PC's limited computer. That, that was the name of his brand before he renamed it Dell. I think that is too. <laughs> but it became Dell. Then people started coming out with laptops. Laptops, portables, luggables, maybe they called them. This is an Osborne with two floppy disks. This is an early Compaq. I think maybe Compaq was the fastest company to ever hit 100 million in sales after startup. I think it did it the first year. Uh, came out of Houston, Rod Canyon. It was an amazing story. And there was an early laptop from Compaq. I think it's a Compaq. Just a couple of people I got to mention. You should research them on your own if you want to pursue it further. J.C.R. Licklider was an MIT psychologist, and he was working for the federal government back late 40s, early 50s. And he was a guy 
Most of the computer guys were saying, oh, artificial intelligence. Someday the computer is going to be so smart it can win any chess game, it can forecast the weather, it can pilot rocket ships, it can outthink humans. It's going to be amazing. And that's where the whole vision was. And Licklider, who wasn't a technologist, he was a psychologist, said, no, no. There's going to be this thing called human computer symbiosis. And there's going to be this thing called the library of the future. He was talking and writing stuff. And then he got a position with the federal government where he had a budget. And he started back in research. And he's a guy saying, look, the average scientist spends 70% of their time looking stuff up. What we need is a better, faster library. We don't need somebody to outthink the scientists. We need something that frees the scientists up to think hard and do things only humans can do. And we need things that allow us to talk all over the world and to network with each other. And, and to be interactive. And, and so the world of the computer we live in today is in many ways the child of Licklider and this guy, Douglas Engelbart. And Engelbart was a guy on the West Coast, an experimenter, and, and I think he was the West Coast. Anyway, he started saying it's got to be easier to work with. We got to, it can't be uh, punch cards and throwing switches and even those typewriters and a TV screen because it was the old DOS operating system and the early software. You had to type everything in. If you type one letter wrong, things oh, I don't know what you want to do. I, I blew up, you know. So he and it evolved to uh, Xerox had a lot of money for making copying machines and wanted to be stronger in computers. They created something called the Palo Alto Research Center, P A R C, Xerox Park, and Xerox Park. They came up with, and it was Engelbart's ideas, and other people working on them, said, no, let's, let's have a, a mouse. They tried like 20 or 30 different ways to interact with the computer. And in fact, they left them all attached to the computer, and they found all the people who came in to play with it just used the mouse. And said, oh, that, and a touchpad, right? And the idea of a cursor, and the idea of windows. And all this resulted in, this was a, a prototype called a Xerox Alto, and then they marketed actually a product called the Xerox Star. And it did all those things. It was the first truly graphical user interface, or GUI, G-U-I. And I forget, five or 10 grand, it was a bomb. Nobody bought them, They're way overpriced. Steve Jobs came over and looked at it and saw it and said, man, you guys should be selling the hell out of these. People would be lined up around the block to buy these. You gotta go out and market these. Anyway, and Xerox, that Xerox Park, there's the two books written about just its history, Dealers and Lightning, and I forget the name of the other one. But all they are is a history of all the things that company blew. You know, if you, if you have found that one place. If you study a long history of Xerox, it had some great successes and some great failures, and actually is in better shape today than it was over the most of the last 20 or 30 years. But anyway, and, and so there's a whole story there. But anyway, so Jobs did the Mac. And actually, it was a fight he had with Wozniak. Wozniak wanted to keep going with the Apple II and making it better. Jobs wanted to go with this whole new system. The Mac was not a success. The Mac was a failure. They, they came out shortly afterwards with a machine called the Lisa, which was bigger and fancier uh, for businesses, but it was like 10 grand. It was a failure, too. It was only years later, and after they'd fired Jobs and went through a whole bunch of failure, that the world kind of caught up. But that all comes from Engelbart. You know, he's the key man. These two guys do talk to each other once in a while. You know, some talk show or something, they got them. Although we may more commonly, and, and they clearly are iconic. They're who we think of when we think of computers today. That's a great picture, isn't it? Um, but the guy they all skip is this guy, Mark Hurd. Mark Hurd, after Kylie Fiorina totally screwed up in, uh, uh, HP, you know, my not so humble opinion, but I, I'm not alone in that. Um, they brought this guy in from NCR, from Patterson's company. And he's the one that turned Hewlett Packard around and has now made him the number one company in the world. And he gets, you know, then he gets attention in the Wall Street Journal. He doesn't make CNN nearly as much as the boys, you know. Um, but he's got to be an interesting fellow. Here's where we are today. I, I forgot to mention in the beginning. All my history talks are really the history of the industry up to the 60s or 70s. Two reasons. One is because there's a lot to be learned there and nobody knows much about it. And second is it gives me a reason, reason to give another speech someday, you know. Uh, uh, but I do like to link to the present. So I jump here at the end, 2009. Here's where we are in uh, the PC market, desktops and laptops. HP 19%, the Taiwanese Acer 13%, Dell at 12.2, Lenovo, the Chinese, Toshiba, the Japanese, and then all the others. 
So HP, you know, has, has got the business back. And they, you know, they screwed up. They really lost it. Even when they bought Compaq, it didn't help. Then, it's interesting, this is all kinds of software. Big computer, little computer, this is the current software ranking, at least according to a good list I found on the web. Microsoft is rules. And actually, if you look them up, the new Fortune 500, they're a much more profitable company than Apple. I mean, their return on investment and everything, it's, it's just amazing. Now, I personally believe Microsoft has peaked. And I, I, I just think they lost all their momentum over the last five to ten years. Uh, but another discussion. But nevertheless, at that kind of peak, they can, <laughs> they can drift for a while. They can glide. IBM's still in there, man. Oracle, SAP, they're German, right? Um, Nintendo, <laughs> look at that. You know, because that's how much software they sell. Because that is software in those cartridges. HP, I guess, making their own software, selling to their users. Um, Symantec, uh, Norton Utilities and all that jazz. Two game companies, both over four billion. Computer Associates, the old mainframe software maker that's still in it. Adobe has come a long way from 55 million. And, and it's interesting, the, the main guy at Microsoft for technology, Charles Simonyi, he came out of Xerox Park. He's retired now, but he was a key guy at Microsoft. And then the two founders, um, one starts with a W and one starts with a G at Adobe, both came out of Xerox Park too. The list, go to the Xerox Park thing in Wikipedia, and the list of famous computer people that used to work there. It's just unbelievable. So those are the software guys. And then, now this is a real broad definition of hardware. Everything that's hardware that has anything to do with computers or communications. So it's more than just PCs, which is why I showed you the PC list a second ago. But it's interesting when you look at it this way. HP, 85 billion. Samsung, 74 billion. Foxconn, who I hadn't heard of till this, till this afternoon when I was putting the list together, that's the company that makes uh, iPods, Apple, makes all the, it makes the Wii's, the Xboxes, and the Playstations. And it makes the iPods, the iPhone, and the iPad. It's a Taiwanese company. It's called Han Hai Industries, but that's part of a bigger thing called Foxconn. It's just amazing. Nokia, uh, the one European player, um, Dell, Toshiba, Intel, LG from Korea, Cisco, Great company. It's amazing. Canon is that big. But with all their copiers and, and I don't, I doubt this includes cameras. Fujitsu, who was really the original big Japanese computer company. And then I continue the list down because Quanta, Motorola, Hitachi, Sony, Ricoh, NEC, Asus, Taiwanese. And so IBM and Apple are like 19th and 20th biggest hardware makers in the world. So it's amazing how much smaller they are. And I'm not sure how they treat the iPod revenue, you know, whether it's double counted whether it's in Apple and in the other one, or they take it out, I'd have to do more research. I always like to say, what should you read? You want to know all about it. Most of what I've talked about tonight I learned from this book. Bill Asprey is a professor here at the School of Information a few blocks away. He's one of the three or four most important computer historians on Earth. And this is a wonderful book. It tells all this story I've told tonight, or basically uh, other books that I used. I have a lot of books, but this is the story of the calculators and typewriters and all that. That's the best single book on the history of IBM. Um, these others are just related books. If you really want to know more about how the machines worked, the Abacus and everything else, Babbage, that's a great book. And I've got two others. This one is a great history of the PC. A little dated. They need to update it. And one more. And I think that means I'm done. And so I can answer some questions. Or... Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments, and you know, if you got to leave, leave. Whatever works for everybody. Yes, sir. Boy, they, IBM was always doing a lot of software all through their life, and for years and years, it was bundled. When you bought the computer, it came with it, and in many cases, it was their customers that wrote the best software. The very first operating system was created by General Motors working on a defense project. IBM picked it up and put it in their big machines. So this later stage that shows the software much bigger, and that might include services, you know. So, uh, so I don't know the answer to your question. Um, but they, have, they, were, they were the biggest in the world in both, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, yes, sir? I was wondering if you could briefly speak to the Osborne business model. You know, Osborne, I don't remember all the details. I remember when it was hot. I have one in my museum at home. Um, I don't. Can you know anything about In a nutshell, he yeah. announced the availability of next generation. Some of his capital was produced the first one and said, next year we'll come out with a faster, better, cheaper 
and it killed him. Wow. And so he invented vaporware. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody had to do it. Yes, sir. What was the first uh, software company to go public? You know, I don't know, but I bet you it was Lotus. I mean, they were hot. Uh, it wouldn't be that hard to find that answer. Rob Adams, who teaches here, was at Lotus during those years. But I didn't, you know, man, they were, they were going, people were going public. Apple went public. Uh, in fact, there's a whole story about them maybe going public too early and all that. So, man, it, they, I wouldn't be surprised if several of them went public in like six months. Because, you know, when something hits. Uh, yeah, yeah, send me an email. Send me an email and I'll, I'll find out. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, you know, Michael Dell's model was to uh, go direct to the consumer, not deal with retail stores, and to basically, as time evolved, he got it to where he built everything just in time. And, you know, he got an order and he built a computer for you. And when I first heard of Dell, all, all the computers I bought that were local were from a company called CompuAd. They were a bigger company. They made real good computers. That guy apparently turned down venture money because he wanted to maintain control, and like two years later, he was bankrupt and out of business. But, uh, so he kind of, because he was doing like 500 million a year when Dell was tiny. Um, but I remember Dell was beginning to show up in list as being among the best quality and among the fastest. And that's the first time I took them seriously. And I, um, Bookstop and Dell were, I believe, the first two clients of PricewaterhouseCoopers. Back then it was just Pricewaterhouse when they first opened their Austin office. The big eight, back then there were eight accounting firms. They didn't have only, I think only one of them maybe had an Austin office. This was too small a town. There were no corporate headquarters here and nothing that mattered much. Trey, um, Trey was here and uh, actually Glastron Boat, but I think they were private. But in any case, so the thing was they didn't need offices here. Well, this was, town was coming along. This was 82. I started my company. I think Dell started in 83. And uh, I remember hearing the stories, though, about how, well, he's really smart and he's hired some good local talent, Lee Walker, and then, you know, later brought in other people. Um, but, you know, they just cranked. And, and I remember writing something for something. It was before I had a blog, uh, right when uh, Carly had HP by Compact. And there was a big battle over that. And the descendant of either Hewlett or Packard, you know, fought her on it and all that. And it was big news. And I remember writing or saying that, hey, this is just a wonderful time for Dell. There was an interview with Michael Dell and Fortune about the same time saying, look, we're, we're focused on what we're doing. We don't need to go out and buy anybody. Whereas she was saying, we've got to have a transformative transaction and this is going to change the world. And, you know, and so they were really riding high. And I think in large part from their company viewpoint, they just kind of reached the end of their string. You know, they had the market. They were the big guy. What are they going to do next? They started selling TVs. They started selling printers. None of those things worked, really worked, you know. And then, and then uh, for whatever reason, consumers went back to stores. And HP moved faster to get back into stores, and so did some of the others. And I, you know, all the details. I, I, I think there are cultural issues at that company, in my humble opinion, from what I've seen, you know. How, uh, I, used to, I was on the board of Whole Foods for five years, and I feel very confident Whole Foods is a wonderful place to work, you know. <laughs> I feel less confident that's true of, of Dell. But I've got to be rooting for them. You know, they're the hometown team, but it's a tough business. And, and selling hardware, I mean, that's what makes IBM so amazing. All those years. Now, I did bring show and tell here, okay, 1931 IBM annual report, right? Short, sweet, letter from Thomas Watson Sr. You know, they don't reveal their sales, only their profits, because that's all the Fed's required. Okay, nice, lean, 1931. We come up to their, 19, their 75th anniversary, 1989, this beautiful book glorifying Mr. Watson and the history of the company, just all this cool stuff. Four years later, 1993, they recorded the biggest corporate loss in American history, $5 billion. Uh, it's been blown through since then, you know, but at the time it was the biggest one ever. So, you know, be careful when you get too big for your britches. I, you know, it, it's natural. A company reaches its what it can get out to. And, and what do you do next? Do you just dividend the money out to shareholders? You stop growing? You give up on it? Um, it's a tough thing. And obviously, he, Michael retired and then he came back. That happened at Gateway where it didn't work. It's happening at Starbucks where the case is still out. Clearly, it's still out at Dell. And you know, while I'm touching on those things, I did, I made some list of trying to draw some patterns in all this and see if anything here is relevant. Um, uh, one thing that's real clear to me, it's true from all my talks, we, we don't yet know what the things we're working with will be called. 
You with me? <laughs> everything we deal with, everything, we, oh, it's this or it's that, social media, it's this or that. That's not what it is. And we won't know until 30 years from now. You with me? You know, because I, I see that over and over. Is in retrospect, oh, it was called this. It wasn't called that by those people at that time. Uh, I wrote down, go with your hobbies. <laughs> you know, go with your passion. I've been preaching that a long time. Uh, the import, oh, none of these things would have made it without being easy to use and having worthwhile application software. And that was true with IBM and everybody, but you see it over and over again. Um, and, okay, and I'll come back to another one, but uh, David. Mm -hmm. And everybody can build add-ons, and as a result, the PC acquired such a large share of the market compared to Apple, where they're insistent on sticking with the proprietary model. Right. And uh, if anybody tried to wanted to build a uh, you know, phone with the Apple, they were having a little lawsuit. Oh yeah, and they tried, you know, here in town, the Peach or Apricot or something. Uh, Power PC. Power PC right. also. Yeah, no question. Put the genie back in the, in the bottle. They came out with something called the, uh, what, the, the, uh, the 52, I think, or the something. OS2. The, the OS2 two here in town. Yeah, that was a big Austin. Running OS2. Yeah. Was the way they thought that the PC should have been designed, and it never sold. No, and, and let's face it, who got rich based on the fact that they had an open standard? It was Microsoft. Because you went and built your IBM clone, you used the Microsoft software. And like I said in the auto industry, the only people that really made a killing in the auto industry are the people that finance them and the people that insure them. You know? John. You know, uh, there's a great book called What the Dormouse Said about all that, and I just touched on it. Uh, I haven't gone deeply, but there's no question. There was a guy named Ted Nelson in the computer lib. His mother was the actress Celeste Holm, and he wrote these books, and, and they're worth a lot of money, and I have one somewhere. I've got to find it. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, there's no question, and, and, you know, they were rads. They were rebels. They were outside the system, all these guys, even Annette Roberts. Um, but a lot of them were hardcore nerds. They came out of ham radio, too. They weren't all rads. And, um, uh, yes, sir. What, what are your thoughts about the future? You know, uh, I have an Apple iPhone. I think it's just a marvel of technology. All that That's stuff. already out of date. <laughs> <laughs> you old time, are you? <laughs> <laughs> What's your thinking about where we'll be in 10 years? Um, you know, I haven't really dwelled on that. I mean, I've been saying for years I, I personally wanted convergence. I just want to carry one gadget. Um, I don't see much evidence I'm going to be right on that, you know. It's sure going to be a long wait. On the other hand, it could be the iPad. You give the iPad 10 years of evolution. I, I, certainly in terms of the companies, kind of things I've talked about tonight, you know, a Apple is the company with momentum, you know. I mean, in terms of, because I really love Microsoft. Now, I have some Apples at home, but I have a lot more PCs, and I'm basically a PC a Windows guy, you know. But, you know, Microsoft, is, it's lost its momentum. It stopped making better and better software a few years ago. I'm not sure for what reasons. In my opinion, as a user, I use them a lot of time. Uh, Jobs is obviously, he's obsessed with the good design. He's obsessed with the user experience. He's clearly a very smart businessman, no more or less so than Bill Gates. Uh, but Gates is off giving his money away. And although Ballmer's a really smart guy, but, you know, success is what usually kills these great companies. So, you know, I... I do know one thing. I used to stand up in the late 90s and people say, oh, the window is going to close. If you're going to start an internet company, you've got to start it right now. 98, 99, you know. Oh, you've got to start. You've got six months. And I'd stand up and make speeches and say, oh, most of the great internet companies in the future haven't been started yet. And people would think I was nuts, you know. Well, Google hadn't been started, YouTube, Facebook, you know. I can stand here today in 2010 and tell you most of the great internet companies in the year 2030 haven't been started yet. You know, if Google thinks they own it and it's the game's over with, eh, no. You know, maybe they will if they got a Thomas Watson Jr. in their blood somewhere. Maybe they will, you know, but it's hard out there. It's one reason I personally want to be in retailing or I want to be in making chocolate chips, you know. I want to be in an industry where I have some control over my own future. Just personal bias speaking. I was coming out of college right now. I go to work for H.J. Hines or Procter & Gamble. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm alone in that regard. Well, I got, I got to, let's see, what did I, I had one more thing. Um, 
Oh, it's the idea. One of the things that's a pattern all through here is it isn't the technologists. Now, the technologists are always there. And the greatest companies do cool technology and get a lot of patents. But the people that really made all the difference, you know, were at minimum technologists with huge business sensitivity. But at the extreme, Watson Sr. and Jr., they were all about making sales calls and treating the customer right and bending over backwards in their glory days. I think a big part of IBM's problem and its long overall decline is it lost that service touch. It became arrogant based on its success. I also have to say in 1969, the federal government sued IBM on antitrust grounds. I know you're too powerful. My observation of antitrust over all these industries is those people always come after an industry at the end of the industry. And they come after and try to kill it when it's already dying, right? It was post-peak because they just, they're looking at historical data. They don't have any vision. So they came after IBM in 69. The, court, the suit was ended in 1982 or 3, 13 years later. And 100,000 pages of testimony, I think $100 million in legal fees. And at the end of it, the government just gave up and said, oh, we don't have a case, we're quitting. So you think about how much energy that took away from IBM's leadership. And I could point to similar cases with um, A&P, uh, supermarket chain, with General Motors, where just as that company really needed all their management's attention, it was distracted for years by what essentially turned out to be nuisance lawsuits by the antitrust people from Washington. A lot of factors there. Um, but the thing is, is I'm thinking, I started making notes, we maybe need to develop a school or a discipline with a new name that is the... The people that start with the user, that start, the lick lighters of the world, right? You know, I mean, that there's a profession. If you really look at it, it's what Watson was, right? Both of them. And, you, and, and it's what lick lighters, it's what Engelbart was, right? And yeah, they may have had all this technological sophistication, but their heart was, I mean, lick lighter was a psychologist. And actually, the information school here at UT, I believe, they claim, I'm on their advisory board, so I have a bias there, but they have the most diverse uh, faculty of any school at the University of Texas. The most number of different disciplines among their professors, because they believe you've got to pull all that together. Uh, Jeffrey. Sure. Uh, well, I'll save that for a retail talk. I have mixed feelings about Macy's, um, but in my observation, they haven't really changed their customer service. All they've really changed are their names, and that upset a lot of people. Um, I can see why they did it. Macy's is a company that is way past its peak, and now it becomes can they age gracefully. It's likely that m most of their traditional competitors will go away. Companies like Dillard's and stuff, I am not optimistic about their future. Nordstrom's is a different trip, you know, and Neiman's is a different trip. But those big old department store guys, it's mainly it's Macy's now. Um, I wouldn't bet against them. They're the only major American retailer, general merchandise retailer that's in every city. Walmart is not in New York City. Macy's is all over New York City. Macy's is in, I think, the biggest city they're not in is Omaha, something like that. So, and I'm kind of rooting the guy who runs it, Terry Lundgren. He, he has a good reputation among merchants. So, but having said that, no, I, I bet on Target. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, patents. Yes, no, and intellectual property, uh, that's uh, an area that really puzzles me because it came up in the auto industry. They have big patent battles early on. Hollerith spent a lot of his time fighting patent battles, as did Watson Sr. Um, sometimes you look and you say, man, they wasted 10 years. They spent all that time, all that money, and the only people who got rich were the lawyers. And they should have been focused on making better products rather than worrying about those battles. Other times you see, oh, well, <laughs> that million dollars they spent on patent lawyers, that paid off. They locked it up for 20, 30 years. Um, you know, it's, it's very, uh, I'm a free market capitalist kind of guy. And, and one of the key things that libertarian types debate is what, what constitutes property? What are valid definitions of property? And it's pretty straightforward, this is mine and ain't yours. It's a lot less straightforward, I had some idea. 
And, and at the same time, though, it's pretty easy to understand that, oh, if I have to give my idea and we all share it, then I'm probably not going to work real hard to come up with cool new ideas. So patent, copyright, trademark, how long should they be protected? And, and I, I'm still like the Amazon Click, and I love Amazon. I love Barnes & Noble, too. But, you know, Barnes & Noble tried to put that in, and then Amazon stopped them. And the one-click purchase, Amazon's got a wrap on. And I'm like, well, that seems like kind of an odd thing to be able to own, you know. But I know there are people paid a lot of money to figure all that out. So there's a very unsatisfying answer. Um, I, 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 overall, I would say focus on the customer. And I mean, everything I've ever done, everything Walmart ever did, everything Target ever did, none of us had any IP, you know. Uh, most of the biggest fortunes in the world, a lot of them are retailing, and none of us ever paid a patent lawyer in. Oh, I have trademarks, but that's kind of it. Uh, it would depend on the business. I would look at it, you know. And, and I, I'd, I, I would definitely go talk to a good patent attorney, you know. Um, but uh, another question? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, uh, there's my cards right over there. Uh -huh. yes. Gary Hoove at MSN.com is the easy one. Just a quick comment in uh -huh. response to what Kevin was saying and your comment about Chuck. It strikes me that what he has really done is recognize in what direction to go towards kind of going. The, the lucky individual has had in all these years has really not been that useful. Uh, and that the, his approach to, to logging the ice and stores and only validating mm -hmm. Yes, and, and, I, and I would say, too, while they're, they've been uh, in a big battle over the iPad and the Kindle, I think that Jeff Bezos is right up there with I mean, both of those guys are incredibly focused on how do we make life better for the customers. And that, that is the secret. There is no question in my mind about that. And uh, it's, um, I was talking to some class, I was talking to says, oh, maybe my next book will be called uh, Simple But Hard, <laughs> because those things are incredibly simple. It's not rocket science. Simple to conceive the idea. Very hard to execute, even in a, in a Target or a Macy's. Very hard to really believe in them and do them every day and really put the customer first. But uh, over and over again, that's, and, and so, yeah, yeah. And, but that was really interesting uh, that I learned studying this was at Jobs when he went and saw Xerox Park. He said, holy Moses, you guys have got the answer. And he hadn't dreamed it up. He took it from them, and then Microsoft took it from him. And, you know, they all knew about the Xerox thing. And actually, he paid like 40000 bucks for the rights to the Xerox people, something like that. Um, but, um, but so he's unchanged in that regard from when he was 21 or whatever. Because um, it's amazing, too. Bill Gates was, I got a letter in one of these books that Bill Gates wrote when he was like 24 years old to all the, all the hobbyists, because they were all stealing each other's software. He said, look, you can't do this. You need really good software, and nobody's going to write really good software if you just get a copy and you pass it to all your buddies. You know, this is, this is theft. And he's like a 24-year-old guy writing this letter to all, these, all his fellow hobbyists, you know. So he hasn't changed in that regard. But uh, there's a lot of truth in what he believed. Uh, yeah? I don't really have a good answer on that. I mean, I think if you look at IBM's annual report, they'd say we're a services company. There's no question. It, if it wasn't a goner, it was in deep trouble. And Gerstner, you know, came in and turned it around, and I think their emphasis on services. And while they're not nearly the powerhouse they were a long time ago, they've at least survived. And it's very rare for a high-tech company to uh, survive, you know, to last that long. The uh, other good example is probably 3M of a company that continually invents new stuff and keeps, and it's great that they're here in town. But yeah, look at Motorola, you know, what a mess. Even Nokia, a mess. I mean, sometimes I look and I say, oh, so how long will it take for the big Korean guys, who appear to me to be the smartest ones right now, for them to become a mess, you know? <laughs> but um, yeah, they believe in services. Anything, anything, yes, sir? Right. One of the last business of the, the largest software companies were looking at Nintendo, they were looking at Activision, they were looking at Electronic Arts. So in terms of the influence on the future direction, do you see consumer entertainment as having as much of a significant an impact as business 
Yeah, and, and I haven't studied that in enough, enough depth or really thought about it. I was surprised to see, I knew EA was big. I didn't realize Activision was bigger. I didn't realize they were both bigger than Adobe. I wouldn't have guessed that. Uh, clearly, it was the PC that brought it into the consumer realm. And, uh, and, and clearly, there's a lot of overlap. You look at a company like Adobe, they've got, you know, there's no TV station or whatever in the world, can't live without Adobe stuff. Or, and yet, they got Adobe Elements, right, for the average Joe. So, um, no, I don't have a strong opinion. I think they both are real promising. Uh, personally, uh, the businesses I've done have really been focused on selling to consumers. Hoover started selling consumers and later morphed into a business-to-business -business thing, but I didn't start it out that way. So uh, I like that personally better. I find it more interesting and fun, you know. Uh, but clearly, Oracle is out there, you know, and not many of us as individuals have bought much Oracle recently. You know, but everybody we deal with is buying it, Amazon and everything, I guess. So it's, it's always, well, it's been a blend since the rise of the PC. Uh, prior to that, it was, I remember when I started Bookstop, the computer book section was like that long. There was a guy named Knuth, K-N-U-T-H, and he'd written a set of books, and that's what we sold, right? Yeah, his books on algorithms, and that was it. And it was, you know, come in to do COBOL. Oh, I also, I never touched on software, which is, I learned Fortran and BASIC to do college homework, you know, but reading the history about how, well, COBOL was a Department of Defense, wanted a standardized system, and ended up being used by all the businesses. BASIC was guys at Dartmouth wanted something simple for students to learn and use, you know, and there's a fascinating history of all the languages and, and even the operating systems. But I thought that was a little too technical. I, I got to believe the future is great for all that, but, but I, I have, I have said, because I'm into both computer video and computer music software and stuff, that um, over time, <laughs> It, it becomes less and less a business machine and more and more all the other things. But I also didn't talk about science, right? The state and national instruments are sitting here in town has just done amazing things, using all this stuff to make oscilloscopes in software and all that. And, you know, that's a huge business still, too. Oh. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, no, I hear you. And, 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 you know, I mean, they're just making the computers faster and cheaper and faster and cheaper, whereas you can truly innovate in software. And, and clearly, I think, I think it's safe to say more money is made in software than hardware. I don't know. You've got that one company in Microsoft that's done so incredibly well. I was surprised to find out at one point they made over half their profit off Macintosh software. That was their main money maker for several years because they were the first one they brought out Excel, Spreadsheet, and Word and all that. Well, uh, yes, sir. I don't know the breakout. Wouldn't be hard to find out. You know, go to their website, investor relations, click on it, get the annual report, or go to hoovers.com and look for their under um, <laughs> products and operations. Uh, click on that tab, and it'll show the breakout by product category. Whatever they reveal will be on there. So we've got to put a plug in for the old company. Um, okay, well, thank you all for coming and hanging out so late. And, um, Email me. If you lose my email address, just go to Hoover's World, click on contact, and it'll come straight to me. And, uh...